Hi, I'm Jim Cates. I'm a psychologist. And this is the 10th in a series of lectures on human development. And this lecture, as did the last two, looks at a theory that considers the interaction of epigenetics, which is the biological basis of development, or nature, and the environment, or social and cultural factors, or nurture. And this is bioecological theory. And as I usually do, I'm going to start with a case vignette. Marie is 93 years old. And until last year, Marie was active and independent. She surrounded herself with family and friends from the neighborhood. She volunteered two days a week, giving tours at a local museum. And she was an excellent cook and enjoyed preparing meals for visitors. But last year, she started considering moving into an assisted living facility. She claimed she was tired and wanted to relax more. So she rented her house to her nephew. And she lived in the assisted living for several months, but found it wasn't to her liking. Meals were less well prepared than hers. She found the staff condescending and others needed more care than she did. So her nephew convinced her to return home and live with them. And that turned out to be a more satisfactory arrangement. Now granted, the demands on Marie's life in her home stretched her physical energy to her limit, the same problem she was having before she decided to move into assisted living. But at the same time, the demands kept her physically active and provided social interaction and connected her to a meaningful setting in the community. Well, bioecological theory provides a lens to conceptualize how an individual's life is supported by their physical context. And also, it provides a lens to understand how processes that contribute to development are ultimately bound up with the settings in which the activity takes place. So for Marie, bioecological theory poses that she is an active agent in creating, modifying, and changing her environment. And bioecological theory grew out of a concern that research and theory of the time lacked a nuanced view of the interdependence between individuals and their environment. And the primary theorist we're going to consider here is a man named Bronfenbrenner. So let me give some historical context here. As the name indicates, the theory builds on the concept of ecology. And of course, ecology is the scientific study of organisms and their environments. And the modern science of ecology emerged in the 19th century. It comes directly out of Darwin's evolutionary theory. And Darwin did not use or talk about ecology, but his ideas of adaptation and natural selection move directly into the concept of ecology. So his were foundational ideas and a model that just led directly to the concept. And so building on these ideas, contemporary ecology urges observation and analysis of all interacting features of an environment. And that includes the organism, the communities that it forms, and non-living aspects. And interestingly enough, in the late 19th century, in the United States, it was the field of home economics that emerged as most influenced by the concept of ecology. So in the context of the College of Home Economics, at Cornell University, Yuri Bronfenbrenner began developing the research program 
that informed bioecological theory. And he was born in 1917 in Moscow. And his parents moved with him to the United States when he was six years old. His father was a neuropathologist. And Bronfenbrenner studied with a wide number of psychologists. Uh, he was exposed to a number of different models of psychological theory. So he had a very broad base from which to understand human behavior. Immediately after graduating with his PhD, he was inducted to the end of the army and assigned to the Office of Strategic Services. And throughout his time there, he also worked with a number of behaviorists and social psychologists, so again was exposed to a wide range of theoretical models and behavioral models. And that all of that helped to frame his thinking. Thirty years later, after doing scholarly work, he published his first book in 1979 called The, uh, the Ecology of Human Development. And the ideas in this work led to a shift in the field of developmental science and an emphasis on greater inclusion of setting characteristics, examination of behavior across settings, and cultural context. So his work really was seminal in encouraging people to look at the environment, the, the ecology of the environment as essential to the developmental process. And he also looked at social policies and practices that impact development. And he was elaborating his theory as late as 2006 when he died. So what are some of the key concepts that Bronfen Brenner comes up with? Well, there are four key concepts. Process, person, contexts, and time. PPCT for short. And I also briefly want to look at Bronfen Brenner's contribution to research. But first of all, the key concepts. Process. What is process? Well, process refers to any of a wide range of interactions between a person and the environment. And these are viewed as basic mechanisms that connect the growing person with people, objects, and symbolic representations in their environment. And much like the, the CHAT, C-H-A-T, focus that we discussed in cognitive social historical theory, these processes are considered activity-based. They're maturational in nature. Uh, the person becomes engaged in the process in new ways, and the process itself is modified to become more complex. What do I mean by all that? Let me give you a very concrete example. As an infant, reading is a passive process. A parent reads to the child. The child does nothing except lie there and listen to words being read. But the infant actually starts with motor behavior to be engaged in the reading process. An infant will grab the book. Uh, an infant will start to imitate sounds. An infant will reach out and turn the pages. Reading becomes a physical process first before it ever becomes a language process. And the baby then may begin to remember parts of the story, become excited about parts of the story coming up, point to pictures in the book that he or she remembers. The baby starts to remember the book by its covers, or books by their covers, and begins to ask for specific stories that he or she wants read. Over time, uh, the child begins to read along and can read parts of the book themselves. And as time passes, the child learns to read on his or her own. So the process of reading has gone from being one of absolute passivity 
in which they are simply read to and have no involvement to the other extreme of reading themselves with no involvement from anyone else. All right? That's an example of a process becoming more complex. And that happens over and over again in development in various areas. Person. Bronfenbrenner acknowledges the biological basis of personal characteristics. He's particularly interested in features of a person that might influence ways they engage in a setting and how they'll perceive resources or opportunities that the setting might provide, but equally important, how they perceive barriers that the setting might provide. And so that's what he looks at when he looks at a person. And he perceived or identified rather three specific features. First are what he calls demand features. And these are things like age, gender, ethnicity, physical ability or disability, body types, all examples of demand features. And these can invite or discourage interaction depending on the environment. Dispositions. These are features of temperament, motivation, persistence. They'll all alter the way in which a person engages in a setting. One of these is efficacy, and we discussed efficacy in reference to cognitive developmental theory as an example of disposition. And he associates this with persistence. The other is resources. To function effectively requires an array of cognitive, emotional, physical, and social resources. And just to take an example of psychological resources, uh, Bronfman Brenner discusses self-regulation, emotional control, humor, flexibility. Uh, all of these are examples of resources that people have to have. So what are the three features that he perceives? Demand features, dispositions, and resources. And he also emphasizes contexts. Bioecological theory views the environment as a set of nested contexts. So we end up moving from immediate face-to-face -face settings to broader features of the culture and society. The most intimate, the most limited context we can have is a face-to-face -face interaction. From there, we interact with more persons, we interact with more complex situations. And the setting refers to any place where people can engage in face-to-face -face interaction. Another key concept is time. Both the individual and the systems in which the person is embedded change over time. So, if, a, if the person is in a family, that family will change over time. Different people will come in, different people will leave. Um, number of siblings will change, probably. Uh, parents divorce and remarry. Uh, aunts and uncles divorce and remarry or cohabitate and stop cohabitating. Uh, different pieces of the system over time will change. Uh, different people will become engaged or disengaged. That's just a function of what happens. Also, the relationships among the various systems will change over time. So, a child goes to nursery school, and then to kindergarten, and then to first grade, and to elementary school, and then to junior high and high school. They're going to different academic settings. Same system of academics and school, but different systems within that setting. Some are patterned 
expected developmental changes. For example, in any culture, there is a universal expectation that there will be developmental stages. Now, those developmental stages may be slightly different or dramatically different depending on the culture, but it's universal that there are developmental stages through which a child progresses culturally. All right, and those are patterned developmental transformations. Some are initiated at the societal level. For example, if a community decides to restructure its school system, the child will find him or herself in a very different system than they were previously. Bronfenbrenner also talks about microtime, and that's the timing and duration of events in microsystems. And that's the length of time, say, a father and a child play together. That's the length of time that um, a family is together for Thanksgiving meal. Uh, that's the length of time that a, an event occurs, a soccer game. Uh, any kind of time-limited event is microtime. Macrotime, on the other hand, is the idea <clears throat> that development of any kind takes place in a historical context. For example, I had a client several years ago who was raised in an African country and during a significant chunk of his childhood, that African country was torn by civil war. And so he was faced with the dilemma of civil unrest, governmental unrest and governmental chaos, uh, never knowing who was going to be in charge, uh, literal risk for his life, um, having to sleep in bomb shelters, uh, chaotic upbringing for several years uh, when he was a child because of the governmental instability in the country where he lived. Right. That is macro time. That is development taking place in a historical context. And Bronfenbrenner would argue that both the theory of development and research have to proceed hand in hand. That we can't just talk about development as if development occurs in a vacuum. We have to consider development in terms of the historical context or the, the environment, the ecology in which it's occurring. So what new directions have come out of Bronfenbrenner's work? Well, in its most mature form, Bronfenbrenner emphasized the central role of proximal processes as basic engines that account for development. And he was concerned that enthusiasm for the study of contexts of development and comparing behavior across contexts, which had been inspired by his earliest writings, failed to incorporate important features of person, place, and time. So people were emphasizing context too much, not looking enough at person, place, and time, and how they were an influence. Uh, unfortunately, after his death, much of the research still done is on context rather than person, place, and time. Uh, it's, it appears to be more compelling writing than anything else he's done. His theory can be applied to development across the lifespan. But it emphasizes the importance of key people that one interacts with in key settings. For example, family, educational, vocational, friends. And Bronfenbrenner was really hoping for greater clarification of the concept of developmental outcomes. And again, that has not occurred. Uh, the emphasis has been more on key people, interactions, that type of thing. So 
it hasn't had the new directions come about that some of the other theories have. It hasn't spawned new directions the way some other theories have. So in terms of a critique of bioecological theory, what are its strengths, what are its weaknesses? Bioecological theory unquestionably has had a significant impact on the study of development. It highlights the importance of looking at experience within settings. Uh, we can't do it in a vacuum. Other theories have made that same point. Bioecological theory backs that same argument well. It was argued, particularly in early writings, for the importance of observing behavior in natural settings. Uh, some believe that it was risky to, to generalize behavior observed in the laboratory, but Bronfen Brenner took it a step further and said, yes, let's do observations in more naturalistic settings. His view of the person changing and encountering changing contexts over time then inspired efforts to conduct large-scale longitudinal studies. And that has been a bonus of this work. It's appealing for its practical value because it informs interventions and guides professional training in both social work and counseling practices. And it deals with relatively large areas of science and pulls them together. And that includes psychology, sociology, history, and anthropology. So several things that make this a strong theory, even though it's not as well developed and well fleshed out as some of the other developmental theories. What are its weaknesses? In terms of the person process context time model, the construct of person is not fully elaborated. There's limited detail on the inner life and therefore little understanding of motives or worldview. Uh, the, the, the cognitive processes get short shrift, bottom line. Same criticism with process. There's an emphasis on proximal processes as a driving force, but Bronfenbrenner really leaves the exact nature of these processes open to interpretation. And the variable of time is also left unspecified. So patterns of continuity and change are theorized to occur over the duration of time, but how much time? Uh, we don't really understand whether we're talking about a, a brief duration of time or whether we're talking about several years, you know, back and forth. What does Bronfenbrenner really anticipate? And although the theory builds on the idea of ecology, Bronfenbrenner fails to incorporate many of the ideas inherent in biological or psychological ecology. And there have been few studies developed to explore the interactive nature of the full model. So Bronfenbrenner's work and the bioecological theory of human development has sparked an interest in direction that would not otherwise exist, but as a full model of human development, it has not done as much as some of the other theories.